Right, good evening everyone and thank you for coming tonight to the public lecture um, by Graham. First of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're on, the Ngunnawal Nambri people. I'd like to recognise their elders past and present and I'd also really like to recognise the other First Nations people who are here in the audience who have come to make this conference so much richer and better. So thank you for coming and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I hope we have a lovely conference. Tonight in the first talk, we have, I have a privilege of introducing a friend and a colleague, Graham Henderson. Graham is well known to many of you, but for those who don't know him, allow me to give you the scuttlebutt. All right. um, Graham was one of the founding fathers of Australian maritime archaeology. And tonight Graham will flag an aspect of his career and his earliest roles in the movement in Australian underwater art heritage, right? However, it's fitting for me to list, and it is like a shopping list, many of Graham's other successes through his career. So as a maritime archeologist, Graham developed awareness of Australia's 18th century shipwrecks, leading expeditions to the wrecks of the Sirius, Pandora, and Rapid. These, these are very famous excavations in Australia. He led a UNESCO mission to examine the feasibility of establishing the world's first underwater museum at the Ferris Lighthouse in Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He inspired David Mearns to join the successful search to find the wreck of HMAS Sydney, and is the author of 13 books and over 100 articles about maritime heritage. It's a substantial thing. Graham also has, in his role as a senior member of a museum, escorted VIPs through the Australian Museum, he has formed partnerships between the Maritime Museum, the Western Australian Maritime Museum, and the Doifkin Replica Foundation for the construction of the Doifkin, which is now located at the National Maritime Museum. And he lobbied successfully to have Australia's most famous yacht, Australia 2, brought back to Australia, or to Western Australia in particular. He's been awarded numerous things. He's been recognised as the sole discoverer of the Gilt Dragon, which he'll talk about tonight. He received the Heritage Award in WA from the National Trust in 1988. In 2002, he was recognised as the Citizen of the Year for Western Australia. 2003, he won the Centenary Medal from the Commonwealth of Australia. And in 2012, he became a member of the Order of Australia, a, a, a wonderful accolade for an incredible career. One of the things that Graham will be talking about tonight is his role as an underwater cultural heritage manager. He was the chair of the International Congress of Maritime Museums in 1987, 1989. In 1988, 1990, he was the president of the Australasian Institute of Maritime Archaeology, or as we call it, AMA. In 1991, 1999, he was the president and the first president of the ICOMOS International Committee on the Underwater Cultural Heritage, or ICOMOS. So Graham is one of the few unifying people in this space. Graham was significantly involved in the development of the draft of the Annex to the UNESCO 2001 Convention for the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. He'll talk about that. He was the Vice President for the Australian Association for Maritime History, a passion he continues. And he was the delegate to the Commonwealth Minister for the old Historic Shipwrecks Act from 1993 to 2005. Needless to say, Graham has done many things and been involved in many aspects. And I'm very pleased to be able to present a friend tonight to give this public lecture. So please put your hands together for Graham Henderson. I was thinking uh, over the last few days uh, after I'd got this invitation to uh, speak tonight, uh, no one said anything about me for years. Um, so I'm darned if I'm not going to talk about myself a bit tonight. So. <laughs> Uh, I've written it all down, and now Andy said the things that I was going to say about myself, uh, but I'm going to repeat them. So if you want to get out, uh, walk out now. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. We meet at a time of delightful anticipation. Ratification, meaning formal consent by Australia, of the Convention on the Underwater Cultural Heritage, a treaty adopted by UNESCO in 2001, is under consideration by the Minister for the Environment, Tanya Plibersek. Ratification will be a foundational moment. 
it will invite a more expansive leadership role for Australia in developing a strong international network of underwater cultural heritage, UCH is so I'll be uh, putting it from now on. UCH linkages with cooperative incentives, knitting together a web of heritage protection for sites extending back 50,000 years or more. For pr practitioners of archeology span underwater cultural heritage, this connected world will mean many partners in the new way of thinking and acting provided by the UNESCO convention. But this is how it all began and developed in Australia. For me, the convention and progress towards our ratification of the convention have been a personal journey starting 60,000, not 60,000 years, 60 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please don't laugh if I make a dozen more mistakes like that. <laughs> um, on Easter, Easter Sunday, 14th of April, 1963, I just turned 16 years old when I made the first Australian waters discovery of a 17th century Dutch East India company, that is VOC, shipwreck site, the 1656 Vergulde Drak. The discovery of this important site was made during a snorkel diving spearfishing trip on my father's boat off Ledge Point, 100 kilometres north of Perth. I recognised reef incorporated seabed wreckage and I showed my discovery to my diving mates. They being my father, James, brother, Alan, a friend, John Cowan, and his friend, Alan Robinson. Significantly, James, my father, was a journalist, a storyteller. From the beginning, he saw the wreck as an inspiration for stories about the earliest European interactions with Australia, rather than as a treasure trove to be plundered. His breaking news articles made headlines in the Australian and international press. So I felt pretty good, I must say. James met for advice with Philip Playford, who had been researching the VOC shipwreck site door, and with West Australian Museum director, <coughs> David Ride. Ride then sought the advice of the Commonwealth Crown solicitor and was redirected to the chap called John Langeland of the state's Crown Law Department. In 1963, Langland provided some very pertinent observations. That the finder of chattels acquires a good title as against all but the true owner. That where silver in coin or bullion is scattered on the sea, it belongs to the first finder. That the crown is entitled to all unclaimed wrecks found in or on the shores of the sea in Australia. That the first finder may claim ownership in respect of a wreck if the rights of that original owner have been abandoned or lost. That if you can establish a claim as owner, the Commonwealth will not be able to claim the wreck as unclaimed, but to establish a claim as owner may involve you in dispute with the party claiming to have been the original owner. And here the Dutch government may be concerned, perhaps as the successor in title to the original owner or as agents for the original owner or as agents for the successor in title and that almost all of part seven of the navigation act has some relevance he completed his advice to ride with the words i do know do not know just what part you are contemplating in the project that would draw your attention to the very limited powers given you under the Museum Act 1969. So there in a nutshell, already in June 1963, were the issues and the optional ways forward. During the winter months of 1963, I was back at school, my father at his newspaper office, but my thrill of having found ballast bricks, elephant tusks, cannon and anchors, was soured after the news of the first salvaged silver coins appeared. They evoked get rich quick dreams for some. In the absence of protective heritage legislation, Alan Robinson set up a camp on the shore and used gelignite destructively across the wreck site to loosen and remove the bullion. He set off a gelignite charge beneath me. When next I, in, when in, during next spring, 
I attempted to snorkel on the site. Good things eventually came of it. In November 1963, we, with the exception of Robinson, wrote to Ride, the museum director, and I'm stating, and I quote, we desire that all contents so far recovered and all yet to be recovered should pass into the ownership and custody of the museum. Fortuitously, Ride had been contemplating expanding the scope of his natural science museum to include what he called human studies. He saw the enormous research and expedition, exhibition potential of such an early site, and he accepted our offer. In December 1963, we completed, with the Crown Law Department, a deed of assignment, transferring our rights under common law as finders of the Vigulda Drak to the museum. Our motive was to inspire the state government to protect and manage this and other important sites, and we succeeded. Our gifting to the museum of finders' rights in 1963 was the catalyst, the deliberated action that precipitated the sequence of events leading both to the creation of the West Australian Maritime Museum and the initiation of the UNESCO 2001 Convention. Philip Playford has written of the Hendersons and Cowan that, I quote, their action was responsible for the WA Museum's first involvement in maritime archaeology. And he was right. But it went further than that. Just 11 months after accepting our gift of rights, the WA Museum, with its bestowed entitlement, was able to have the state government enact the Museum Act Amendment Act of 1964, listing as protected scheduled historic wrecks, the Trial, Batavia, the Guldedrak, Zeitdorp and Zaywick together with the unnamed Cottesloe wreck, thought Dutch or Portuguese by the diving community and listed in the act as dated approximately 1600. That act failed to deter Robinson. In 1965, he applied unsuccessfully to the museum for a salvage contract on the Begol de Drac site. Acting director of the museum, Ray George, reported on the reporting on the interview noted, and I quote, he told me that I had forced him to take action and that he had planted 60 explosive units under rocks on the wreck site. He then drew a diagram showing gelignite detonators, battery and wires leading out of the container. The wires were attached to a balloon. He said that anybody removing the rock that holds any of these units down would release the balloon, thus pulling the wires and thereby setting off the charges, end of quote. In 1969, Robinson went on to loot the 1622 trial, Australia's oldest known shipwreck site. So the state legislated the Maritime Archaeology Act in 1973, formalising the concept of maritime archaeology as a branch of knowledge and protecting, protecting our Dutch and more recent colonial period sites. However, continuing legal challenges by Robinson, a lack of certainty about territorial limits and growing interest by other Australian states and territories in protection of sites such as the Pandora of the Bounty Mutiny story, the Sirius, the first ship fleet flagship, and Sydney Cove led the Commonwealth to enact the Historic Shipwrecks Act of 1976. The Dutch government, successor entitled to the VOC and VOC shipwrecks, had not felt that they could negotiate with, us West, with Western Australia because we, little old Western Australia, were not a sovereign power as far as they were concerned. The Commonwealth of Australia was the sovereign power. Subsequently, as David Wright has put it, and I quote, as a result of the two visits I paid to Holland, in 1965 and 1972, an agreement was reached with the Dutch and was signed between Australian government and the Dutch. Ultimately, protection was provided in all our waters, echoing Langdalant's true owner words from 1963. The Commonwealth's 1976 Act acknowledged the Australian Netherlands Committee on Old Dutch Shipwrecks, or ANCODS, agreement of 1972 whereby the Dutch government, as heirs to the VOC, 
transferred to Australia whatever rights they had to underwater cultural heritage in Australian waters. The logic of this bilateral agreement was later extended to broader international agreements. I joined the museum staff in 1969 and I was deployed with the team of police and ex-military museum divers who were examining damage and removing explosives attached by Robinson and others to the sites of the trial in the 1629 Batavia wreck. With university qualifications in history and archeology, span I commenced development as the first stage of the state's historic shipwrecks program of a sites in inventory and collection catalog, which is the normal way you do things in archeology, span to understand the extent of the underwater cultural heritage we were responsible for. And I conducted archaeological interventions on the threatened Cottesloe wreck. The state government was supportive and the museum established departments of maritime archaeology headed by Jeremy Green and conservation headed by Colin Pearson. Our excavation reports on the supposed 1600 Cottesloe wreck, the 1622 trial and the 1656 Vigulda Drac were published, progressing the museum's reputation in Australia and abroad. Like the pirates of old, Robinson came to a bad end. In the early 1980s, he faced charges and accusations of stealing between 800 and 1,000 sticks of gelignite, of having threatened to kill his former de facto wife and give her granddaughter an acid bath, and of conspiring with Sydney underworld figures to have his ex-girlfriend disfigured with acid or blown up with gelignite and planning to blow up car bombs in Melbourne to hold the city to a $3 million ransom. All of this is in the newspapers at the time, as well as uh, the law courts. He was found hanged in Long Bay Jail in 1983 while awaiting verdicts on very serious charges. Piratical activities were fast developing in oceans around the world at that time as uh, scuba diving developed. The provisions of the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea were regarded as deficient as regards underwater cultural heritage. In 1985, Carsten Lund of Denmark prepared a draft European Convention on Underwater Cultural Heritage, but Turkey objected and the idea lapsed. In Australia, however, the situation was ripe for developing international level protection. The public were fed up with the ongoing destructive activities of treasure hunters. And the record visitation levels showed, it, showed that the general public were impressed with the exhibition and research programs of the Shipwrecks Museum and the WA Maritime Museum in Fremantle. Australia ICOMOS, the National Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, a UNESCO partner, had been formed in 1976 at the urging of then Australia Heritage Commission Chair David Yenkin. He saw the need for conservation practitioners to develop, to develop policies and programs in Australia's, for Australia's cultural heritage. ICOMOS provides an international link between those involved in the conservation and study of places of cultural significance. In 1988, John Womersley, as manager of South Australia's State Heritage Branch, wrote to UNESCO's Cultural Heritage Division in Paris, concerned that entrepreneurial, motiva entrepreneurial motivated salvage of artefacts from the VOC ship Gilda Malson in the South China Sea and the SS Titanic. Oh, great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to buckle down, <laughs> buckle up. <laughs> so. Andy, if you hear my voice croaking like that, uh, uh, could you give me a yell? <laughs> um, John Womersley, as manager of the South Australia's State Heritage Branch, wrote to UNESCO's <coughs> Cultural Heritage Division in Paris, concerned about entrepreneurially, I can never say that word, uh, motivated salvage of artefacts from the VOC ship Gelder Malson in the South China Sea and the SS Titanic in the Atlantic. He referred also to an Australian company that had issued a prospectus for a share issue in a treasure salvage company to plunder sites overseas. 
and he urged UNESCO to develop an international convention for their protection. UNESCO's Margaret Van Vliet made the salient point in her reply to Womersley that until states enacted laws for protect, proper protection of their underwater cultural heritage, there was little chance that an effective international convention could be generally accepted. And of course, that's very relevant to Australia today. Of course, Australia ha has already enacted such laws, but has yet to ratify the convention. Significantly, ICOMOS International's president also wrote back to Womersley saying, and I quote, bearing in mind the interest you and other Australians have demonstrated in this question, we're thinking very seriously about preparing the ground for an international committee with your help, end of quote. A similar issue, the need to develop and inter implement international policies and programs for the conservation of these sites had been discussed the previous year at the ICOMOS General Assembly in Paris. They wrote to Australia ICOMOS, suggesting that we consider establishing under the auspices of ICOMOS, an international committee. They added that to achieve such a proposal, it was as necessary for Australia ICOMOS to identify a person, a suitable person, an Australian in the first instance, to be initial chair, together with a specialist institution prepared to provide administrative support. In February 1989, as president of the Australian Institute for Maritime Archaeology, that is AMA, and there's lots of AMA people here today, uh, I had written to Australia ICOMOS inquiring about institutional membership for AMA. In reply, their chair, Jane Lennon, sought my and our views on the formation and functioning of the proposed international committee. I had joined the staff of the WA Museum as a graduate assistant in 1969, becoming the first director of the Maritime, WA Maritime Museum when it was formed in 1992. I sustained burning ambitions, both to make the Maritime Museum one of the best in the world and to improve the level of protection of the underwater cultural heritage globally. In 1989, at the invitation of the Australian Cultural Development Office, a section of the Department of Cultural and the Arts, I commenced compilation of a code of conduct published as guidelines for the management of Australia's shipwrecks. It comprised the principles and practices adopted by Australia's professional maritime archaeologists and was also intended for heritage bodies, developers, teachers and the diving community. In 1991, ICOMOS Australia Chair Joan Domicell wrote to the WA Museum's director that ICOMOS International's executive had proposed that Australia ICOMOS establish an international committee on underwater cultural heritage. Domicell sought the commitment of the museum, firstly, to allow Australia ICOMOS to propose me as the chair of that committee, and secondly, to name the WA Museum as its administrative focus. Later that year, ICOMOS International's Vice President wrote informing me of their approval of the creation of the International Committee on Underwater Cultural Heritage, that is ICUCH, and of my appointment as Chair of that committee. The particular object of ICUCH was to promote international cooperation in the identification, protection and conservation of sites, and to advise ICOMOS on the development and implementation the programs in this field. I based ICUCH at the WA Maritime Museum in Fremantle. The WA Museum provided administrative support from a Commonwealth grant, and I thought I brought together heritage experts from around the world. Membership, initially from Australia, Canada, Netherlands, and the Philippines, was rapidly expanded to include the USA, Denmark, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, the UK, Israel, India, Kenya, Argentina, Mexico, USSR, Sweden, Egypt, British West Indies, France, and Honduras, and to represent the five geographical regions as defined by UNESCO, that being Africa, the Arab states, Asia and the Pacific, Europe and North America, 
Latin America and the Caribbean. So we had the world sewn up. Around the same time, the International Council of Maritime Museums, ICMM, <coughs> then representing some 300 museums, was concerned about the way advances in underwater exploration technology and the activities of some of their members were leading to destruction of sites such as a Titanic. They invited me to chair a committee to survey their collecting pra practices. The survey indicated the need for standards specifically to maritime museums. The guidelines we developed were adopted in 1993 modifying the collection practices of their major museums internationally. Since the mid-1980s, our initiatives in Australia had been attack, attracting the attention and support of two Australian legal experts working with international organisations, Patrick O'Keefe and Lyndall Prott, drew inspiration from our proactive approach. They recognised both the need for an effective international instrument of protection and the need for a partnered approach between legal and heritage experts. And that, uh, that concept of a, a partnered approach between legal and heritage is incredibly important uh, for anyone who's, uh, any nation who uh, uh, wish to protect their underwater cultural heritage. In 1988, the International Law Association had established its Cultural Heritage Law Committee and that committee, chaired by O'Keefe, commenced a draft convention. Past efforts at such a measure had failed, their scope not having envisaged extending further than the continental shelf or 200 miles offshore. O'Keefe took it up on a universal scale. He, elaborate, he collaborated closely with Prot, UNESCO's chief of their international standards section in Paris, and one of the uh, who who was that and, and and who was also one of the pioneers of cultural heritage law in association with ICOMOS, we in ICUCH initiated member projects including the development of proposals for world heritage listing a case studies publication and a textbook but our first mandate was to develop a charter to guide the management and protection of underwater cultural heritage in 1991, O'Keefe had, had approached me as chair of ICUCH to ask whether we would, would assist in the preparation of a set of principles which could be attached to his draft convention as a charter, something by which states could judge whether what archaeologists had done on sites had been acceptable. From these principles, together with O'Keefe, we developed the International Charter on the Protection and Management of underwater cultural heritage adopted by ICOMOS in Sofia in 1996 to ensure that all site in investigations are explicit in their aims, project, in their aims, methodology and anticipated results, making the intention of each project transparent to all. In 1997, the UNESCO General conference resolved that the protection of the underwater cultural heritage should be regulated at the international level and that the method adopted should be an international convention. The draft convention, complete with the appendix drawn up by ICUCH to define appropriate behaviour on underwater cultural heritage sites, was presented to UNESCO who explored whether they should use the draft as a model in drawing up a UNESCO convention. They called together an experts group of heritage managers and legal experts from both UNESCO and non-UNESCO states for a meeting in Paris organised in consultation with the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs and the Law of the Sea and the International Maritime Organisation. Craig Forrest, who I hope is here today, a cultural heritage and maritime law expert whose interests focused on the international law applicable to Rex, was a member of the South Australian delegation. He later moved to the University of Queensland, where he further developed this work. The experts agreed 
that there was a need for a legally binding instrument for the protection of underwater cultural heritage. And the UNESCO Secretariat was asked to study ways of developing a new convention. It's because I had a couple of sips of wine before, it means you get very thirsty. In 1997 to 98, my commitment to the Maritime Museum, as, as the Maritime Museum's director, to the building and outfitting of the new Fremantle Wharf, Wharfside Exhibition Facility precluded me from standing, from standing for re-election as ICWIC president. And we elected a ca Canadian, Robert Grenier, to that position. I passed my ICWIC Australian re representative position on to then AIMA president, David Nutley, who actively lobbied the Australian government, and I think is here today too, and later served as vice president of ICUCH. Many people, including some of you here to this evening, have been committed to see the ongoing work of ICUCH from this time. <clears throat> it has required a dedicated and concerted effort by many in Australia and around the world to achieve the outstanding progress within the UNESCO framework. During the years 1998 to 2000, the experts group drafted the UNESCO 2001 convention. Four sessions of intergovernmental, intergovernmental negotiations provided the text, Australia playing a key role. Lyndall Crott has written that many of its provisions are modelled on the Australian legislation and on the terms of the ANCODS agreement to share knowledge and artefacts. A modified form of the International Charter was incorporated in the convention as the annex rules concerning activities directed at underwater cultural heritage. This is a code of conduct of binding treaty provisions by which states can judge the acceptability of archeologists' activities. The Charter's modification as the rules has thus become the standard guide to the ethics and practice of underwater cultural heritage management throughout the world. While the convention in its entirety constitutes the most significant global advance in protecting this heritage. However, as we're well aware, Australia has not yet ratified the convention. In 2014, wanting to encourage the Australian government to ratify, I wrote to Environment Minister Greg Hunt, but received no reply. Then I sought the advice of the federal member for Fremantle, Melissa Park, as to how to encourage ratification. Park's chief of staff, Josh Wilson, now the federal member for Fremantle, and chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, Jay Scott, as they are better known, was strongly supportive and provided me with three dot points he considered necessary to persuade the government to move ahead. One, why we should be in a hurry to ratify when so few comparative nations had ratified. Two, how ratification would deliver something significantly different and valuable. And three, how ratification would not create regulatory red tape difficulties in other areas, especially economic projects and development. I thought that we should be in a hurry to ratify. I replied to Wilson with some of the justifications. One, that 55 other nations had ratified the convention. Note that by September, 2023, a total of 72 states are listed as having ratified. Secondly, that the convention had already transformed approaches to the underwater cultural heritage throughout the Atlantic Rim. And thirdly, that Australia, regarded as a world leader in the management of underwater cultural heritage, could, as a ratified nation, play a major progress progressive influence on other nations in the Indo-Pacific and Asian region and lead the way to a more enlightened approach throughout the region. In February 2022, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Maurice Payne, tabled the convention. The convention process stopped in line with machinery of government processes associated with the 2022 election, federal election, Following the election, uh, Tanya Plibersek agreed to be the 
conventions, uh, agreed to the conventions consideration process continuing. And in August 2022, the new Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Penny Wong, retabled the convention for consideration by J. Scott. J. Scott conducted a public hearing and in March 2023 recommended that Australia ratify the convention. The recommendation reads, the committee supports the convention on the protection of underwater cultural heritage and recommends that binding treaty action be taken. Ratification will not create onerous red tape difficulties. Since enactment of the 2001 convention, the Australian government's Underwater Cultural Heritage Act of 2018 has been constructed with all the necessary amendments to enable ratification. The experiences of the ratified nations have not shown examples of regulatory difficulties for economic projects and development. Rather, ratification creates benefits for participation for participants and provokes collaboration between nations. The dot points have all been addressed. With no bar barriers to ratification, Australia can demonstrate its full commitment to the convention and fully assert its role as a world leader in the management of the underwater cultural heritage. Andy Viduka, in his role as Assistant Director of Underwater Cultural Heritage in the Department of Climate Change, etc., uh, has brought us all together now <laughs> to, <laughs> to celebrate the long awaited but surely imminent announcement of ratification by the Australian Government of, this, of the UNESCO 2001 Convention. Andy leads the Australian Underwater Cultural Heritage Program, co-drafted the Underwater Cultural Heritage Act, which he administers, and leads Australia's consideration of ratification process. In that later role, he has shepherded the convention through 14 years of consideration, changes of government, and the myriad twists and turns entailed in government process. When Australia ratifies the convention, it will be more than symbolic, supporting a broader collaborative protection with other regional states. It will be a major progressive movement for Australia, facilitating the development of a stronger supportive network of linkages through Asia, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, with incentives to cooperation. As custodians and managers of the underwater cultural heritage, and as general community members alike, the underwater world is our oyster with this new way of thinking provided by the UNESCO Convention. May it occur soon. Thank you for listening.